to be back. I come from New Orleans, and one of my mentors was a novelist who said there are two types of people who come out of New Orleans, preachers and storytellers. And he said, for heaven's sake, be a storyteller. The world has too many preachers. And that's why I love 5 by 15. When I was a young student down here in school, uh, I came home one day and found on my bed a book called The Double Helix that my father, who was a scientist, had left for me. Of course, it was a story that James Watson had written about the discovery of the structure of DNA. I was pretty fascinated. I even found my old copy and written in the margin. I defined words that were new to me, such as uh, biochemistry. Uh, but as it turned out, I never really pursued biology as much as I thought I was going to. I grew up in the digital age and was very interested in computers and digital coding rather than genetic coding. And in my career, I ended up writing books, including Steve Jobs, the one that Daisy mentioned, about the digital revolution. However, about a decade ago, I began to realize that the advances of the digital revolution were gonna pale in comparison to the revolution that was going to occur in the first half of this century, the first half of the 21st century, which was a life sciences revolution in which molecules will become the new microchip. We'll be able to program them, program them to do things, to make vaccines for the coronavirus and to edit our genes and to do all sorts of things that we used to only uh, dream or have nightmares about. And I met a woman named Jennifer Doudna, and she too told me the story of finding the double helix on her bed when she came home from school one day. And she read it and she noticed a character in it that I hadn't paid much attention to named Rosalind Franklin, who had done the imaging work that allowed Watson and Crick to figure out the structure of DNA. And she told me that up until then, she had not realized that women could become scientists. And so she told her school guidance counselor she wanted to be a scientist. And the guidance counselor in Hawaii, which is where she grew up, said, no, 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 girls don't become scientists. Well, that made her persist. And she also learned to pursue things that the others in science, especially the men, weren't pursuing. Because when she was in the graduate school in the 1990s, most of the men were pursuing DNA, that molecule that's at the heart of the double helix, and that encodes our genes and uh, passes them along to future generations. But Jennifer was more interested in RNA, sort of the not very famous uh, sibling of DNA. But like a lot of famous uh, siblings, DNA actually doesn't do much work. It just sits in the nucleus of our cell, curating our genetic information. What RNA does is it goes in there, takes a little snippet of gene uh, or of coding, and goes and builds proteins in the outer region of our cell. It actually make thing, makes things. Jennifer was able to discover the structure of RNA, just like Watson and Crick and Rosalind Franklin discovered the structure of DNA. And uh, her professor told her, always ask the big questions. And she said, what's the big question here? And he said, how did life begin on this planet? And she was able to show how RNA can copy itself. And thus it was the molecule four billion years ago that started replicating and began life on this planet. As a student of RNA, she got introduced to something called CRISPR. There was another woman scientist at Berkeley who had been studying these clustered repeated sequences that can be found in bacteria. And they were kind of mysterious. I mean, why would bacteria repeat sequences of their genetic code? And they eventually discovered that it was the way that uh, bacteria fought viruses. They would take a mugshot of any virus that attacked them and put them in these CRISPR sequences in their own genetic code. So if the virus ever attacked again, boom, the bacteria could chop it up 
using a scissors, using an enzyme. Uh, that's a pretty useful thing to know in this era of coronavirus. And when Jennifer Dowd started looking at it, she and a French biologist she had met in Puerto Rico said, we're going to figure out a way to repurpose this system bacteria have been using for 3 billion years and use it to cut our own DNA. We can, we can program the guide RNA. So instead of cutting up the, a virus, it could also cut our own genetic code and make edits in what we are. And that's what won them the Nobel Prize in 2012, creating a system called CRISPR that allows us to edit our own genes. Now, after she did that, she had a nightmare. And the nightmare was that somebody wanted to learn about her new technology. And she walked into the room to meet the person. And when the person looked up, it was Hitler. And so Jennifer gathered groups of scientists over the past few years in order to figure out the ethical uses of CRISPR. They've already used it, her tool, uh, and the one that Emmanuel Charpentier developed with her to cure sickle cell anemia which is a dreadful genetic disease with, with only a one letter mutation. And now people have been cured of that. There are many easy genetic diseases that are gonna be cured in the next few years. Other blood diseases will even be able to fight cancers that way. But the ethical issue comes in when, instead of doing it in a patient who can give consent, you do it in sperm or eggs or reproductive cells or early embryos so that the edits are inheritable. They're passed down over the generations. You've edited the human species. And everybody thought, well, nobody's going to do that right away. But two years ago in China, a rogue scientist edited the early stage embryos of what became twin girls in order to take out the receptor for HIV. Uh, the virus that causes AIDS. And there was a huge outcry, people fighting against that happening. And the Chinese, Americans, and British, under Jennifer Doudna and other people gathering them, have put in a rule. They arrested the scientists in China and put in a rule that you can't now make inheritable edits. But once we got hit with the coronavirus, you know, people began to say, wait a minute. Remind me again what's wrong with editing the human species so that we're less susceptible to viruses? And uh, don't every creature, large and small, in God's creation use every trick in its playbook to help make sure that it thrives as a species? Why wouldn't we do inheritable edits if it can help us? So that led to the moral questions I try to explore in this book. Maybe there are some inheritable edits to get rid of sickle cell, maybe to fight viruses. Jennifer Doudna and her team were able to use this CRISPR technology to make virus detection kits for coronavirus, to make antivirals. And of course, the ability to code a piece of RNA as a messenger has been used to code so that it makes a part of the spike protein of the coronavirus in our own cells. And that's how we get the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. But what we're going to have to do is figure out when should we not use this technology in the future? And for me, there are two particular thoughts I would have and leave you with. One is if we do it, it has to be fair and equitably distributed. We don't want the rich to be able to go and buy better genes for their children. Not only would that exacerbate the inequality we already have, it would encode it into our species. Just like in the novel Brave New World or the movie Gattaca. And the second thing is I worry about taking out some of the diversity that makes our species both colorful and creative and perhaps even resilient. The balcony right behind me, you see those doors, it opens to Royal Street here in the French Quarter of New Orleans. And I remember as I was finishing the book, sitting on that balcony and looking down 
at the passing parade of humanity as New Orleans came back to life as coronavirus receded here. And there were people tall and short and fat and skinny and black and white and Creole color and every different hue and gay and straight and trans. And some were even deaf from Gallaudet University doing sign language. And I think that if we allowed everybody to say, I'm gonna edit my children this way, we'd be at risk sometimes of losing that flavorful diversity, that natural lottery that sort of says, hey, I've been gifted with what I have and I'm empathetic to other people. So as we move forward, I hope we can do this slowly, step by step, figuring out when we're gonna gene edit our children and our species. And it's a slippery slope. So that's why we got to do it cautiously, step by step, and preferably hand in hand. Thank you all very much.